All right, hello everyone. Today I'm going to talk about the solar return chart, or Varshafal, as we call it in Indian traditions. And this will be just a little bit of an introduction and a tour around your Varshafala chart, or solar return chart. Now, that is kind of an interesting thing, is that uh, all the different traditions of astrology really emphasize this system of creating a chart for the moment the sun has come back to the exact degree and minute and seconds of arc that it was when you were born. So the idea is that your first, your birth chart you've already looked at is like your solar return for year zero. But then next year, when the sun reaches the exact point of, you know, 13 degrees and 14 minutes and this and that of Aries, the exact point it was when you were born, then boom, you cast a chart for that exact moment and you read that and that chart will tell you how that year will go and each year you get a new one of these. And in, and that's what's so fascinating is that this, this system is, was a very big deal in ancient India, but it was also a very big deal in ancient Persia and it was also a very big deal in the Greek uh, Hellenistic traditions. So really all traditions that have 12 signs zodiacal astrology have really emphasized solar return charts or Varshafal. The word Varshafal, Varsha means rainy, but refers to one of the one of the six classical seasons, the Varsha season, and so it also refers to a year. And then Fala or really Pala means fruits. So Varshapal is actually how it should be pronounced, but just in modern day parlance it's being pronounced as Varshafala. But yeah, Varshapal Varshafala, this means the fruits, fala or pala of the year. Of Yeah, fruits of the year. What kind of fruits are going to come forth for the person in this year? That's what Varshafala means. But this is the same exact idea as, you know, solar return charts. Now, the techniques are actually, a lot of them are very, very, very much the same. But there are, of course, a lot of specific, unique things that the Vedic uh, astrologers seem to have developed well over the centuries of them doing solar return astrology. So there are, uh, there are these things called sahams, which are what we call like the lots or the parts of fortune, I believe, in Hellenistic or Greek traditions. You guys can correct me if I'm wrong, because I really don't know much about the other traditions outside of Vedic astrology. But uh, these, we call them sahams. So we have the Punya Saham or the auspicious Saham. Each year you have a part of the chart that's really auspicious. And you see there's a zillion other ones too. The Punya Saham is the most auspicious one. This relates to the part of fortune in Western, classical Western traditions. Um, so this is, you know, of course, just a tour through the Vedic style of solar return chart, but this is what I wanted to show you guys about. So yeah, so we have Sahams, we have these different types of strengths, we have these different dashas, it's crazy. So what do you start with? Um, if you happen to have Kala, you should pull up the Varshafal screen. If you don't have Kala, what are you doing? You got to have Kala if you're going to be a serious astrologer. Um, you know, there's don't, don't go buying any of those horrible other softwares like Jagannath or Prashers Light or I don't even know if those are still around now but when I was starting out there were a bunch of terrible softwares and Call is the best one it's also the cheapest one and the most customizable and the one of the only ones that's actually created by someone who really knows their astronomy and their calculations so you got to have Call to start with then you in Call you pull up the Varshafala screen and it has its entire own screen with all these different uh, things if you double click or right click you get a bunch of different tables that are helpful. You can look at even the Vargas within this year Lee chart. Um, but to start with, with solar returns, you get something. If you look at this table, you see the year and you can select the age. You can go backwards or forwards. You get a table. See how it says Munta, Varshapati, and these other things. These are these other Patis or Lords. The strongest of these becomes the year lord or the Varsha lord, Varshapati. Pati means lord, like Ganapati for Ganesha, you know, Varshapati. So year lord, moon. 
So you want to look at the year Lord. You also want to look at the ascendant Lord. Sometimes these are the same. In this chart, they're the same. The ascendant is Cancer, so the ascendant Lord is the moon, and also the year Lord is the moon. And then there's a third factor you want to look at, the Muntha. The Muntha is in Virgo in this one, and so the Lord of the Muntha is Mercury. So these are the three important factors we want to look at. The Lagna Lord is probably the most important, but you want to look, read the Year Lord and the Muntha Lord as well. And these are like the self factors. So this is my Varsha Fall for the year of 2017. The Moon and Mercury were the were everything for me that year. And Moon and Mercury are Vaishya planets, are merchant planets. And this was a big year for me for building my astrology business and um, yeah, and all of that. So the Muntha, you might be wondering, what is the Muntha? Well, the Muntha or Muntaha, as it some, sometimes is said, from the time you're born, if when you're born, you get that first sign that is your Lagna is the Muntaha, and then it and then it changes one for each sign. So this year it's Virgo. The year before it would have been Leo. See how the Muntha says Leo it would have been there. The year before it would have been in Cancer. See, so it goes. It changes one each each sign. It's basically the Indian version of your progressed Lagna, your progressed ascendant. Okay, so. This is the same idea, but using Sanskrit or whatever, or using other words. But yeah, Muntha is Virgo. So the progressed Lagna is Virgo. So you also want to consider the Lagna Lord of that, Mercury and what he's doing. And analyzing these three factors will give you a lot of, right off the bat, you'll have a big emphasis. So say, say Venus is the year Lord and the Muntha or the Ascent Lord or all three or something, then you know that relationships and Ven Venus factors are already going to be a big thing for this year right off the bat so that's a super simple technique you guys can work with and of course there are other things that might override it but you know if the year lord is jupiter you might have a child that year you know or if the year lord is venus you might get married or if the year lord is moon you might start a business and grow it or expand it if you've already started one um and so then you want to look at these factors and look at what they're doing but you don't want to just analyze them in the same way that, of course, you could analyze them still in the normal way you've already learned, and you would get some good insights for sure. But there are specific ways that we like to analyze the solar return chart. And you have uh, what we call applying, we, you have these yogas, these specific yogas that are tajika yogas, as we call them. And now this is something that I don't know, I think I'm sure. I know that some of these combinations or yogas are in, are in the Western and Greek traditions, but I have a feeling a lot of them are not um, because they deal with things that are specific to Jyotish, like planetary war or whatever. Um, but yeah, you, the main thing that you can start with is applying or separating yogas. This is what everybody's doing. This is what all the ancients did in the ancient times too. So for example, the moon is a, is aspecting Jupiter in this chart by a square aspect. And you can just use normal, regular Western astrology aspects to do this. And I could go into all that but to save time. Just if you know Western astrology, you're just using those same things. So this is a square aspect. Then you start, then you look at the applying and the separating quality. What that means is that, okay, the moon is a faster moving planet than Jupiter and Jupiter slower. So that means that the moon will soon reach 23 degrees, the same degrees as Jupiter. So the moon is applying in this aspect to Jupiter. And that means that there can be something going on. An applying aspect uh, means someone's going to apply to, something new is going to be applied, something new is going to happen in life. And then there can be, say, if moon was at 25 degrees of Cancer, it would be, it means it just did aspect Jupiter perfectly and not separating from that aspect. And that means that you're either going to separate from something or resolve something or complete something or an event's going to come up based on something you already know about, though, not a new event coming. 
a lot of times the classical old books just say you'll separate from the thing. And that's true a lot of times, but not always. Sometimes it means you're going to actually have the event based on, but it's not a new event, it's something based on something from the past you already know about. So you got these really cool aspects and all this stuff, you know what I mean? It's a blast. And, and then you've got these strengths, you know, you've got to measure each planet with these different strengths, the, the Panchavargya, the Dwadasha, the Harsha. In a really quick nutshell, there's so much I could convey on this that I'm going to in my courses and more in depth, you guys, but uh, just for the beginner out there who might need this video, uh, the punch of Argya is the overall punch the planet has, the force, the overall force it has, kind of like Shadbala. But a planet can have a lot of force, but then still be debilitated or inauspicious and causing problems. So that's the Dwadash of Argya, the overall auspiciousness or inauspiciousness of it. So like moon super strong, but was actually more inauspicious than it was auspicious. And then you have the harsha points, which literally harsha means like bristling, <laughs> hardy with an erection, actually. Like it's a word for Shiva, like harsha, like because he was the, the lingam that was always, you know, ready to go and aware. And so harsha means your alertness, a readiness, eagerness, how hungry you are, how ready to go you are. And so the moon was doing well there. But if you have plants that are at zero harsha, then that can mean that you're not that interested and you're not that ready to go for that sort of thing. Like, especially if it's Venus and you're not that interested in romance that year. Um, I was mainly just obsessed with astrology this year, um, like most years. But, <laughs> but yeah. Um, so you use these strengths, these points, and this is really fun. So then like Mercury... Um, has 12 points of punch and plus 12 minus zero and five. So my Mercury was so robust and ready to go that year. And Mercury was in the eighth house of the occult. And Mercury is the Muntha Lord. So that really speaks to, wow, this year, Corey is going to be a Mercury, a student, an apprentice of the eighth house of astrology in the occult. It's a Buddha Ditya yoga, you know what I mean, for learning and skillfulness, developing a lot of skill, increasing the light in the eighth house, the occult, and sign of Aquarius, sign of psychology. Um, that's, that is the majority of what I did that year. And like I said, Moon and Mercury were my two self factors, and I was just obsessed with building my business. And um, I, taught, uh, I taught publicly that year for the first time. And then this year was the year that I actually met my teacher, Ernst Wilhelm, in person. And actually met him like physically in person and what's fascinating is that there's different dashes that show that but first off the yoga of the moon to jupiter shows applying to jupiter applying to a guru also because jupiter ruled the ninth house and ninth cusp so that's very interesting um and then you have different dashes muda is better for sahams patayini is best for these yogas so you look at the uh, applying yogas and, okay, moon is applying to Jupiter. So in either the moon or Jupiter dasha, a new event could happen. Usually it's in the one that comes first. That's what my teacher said. And his own techniques, his own teachings, <laughs> Ernst taught this, and his own teachings will explain why I met him when I met him. Because it was the moon patayini dasha, 11 2017 to twelve twenty, Less than a month worth of time out of this year, that happens to be the time that I flew to Sedona or flew to Prescott, hung out with Ernst for a weekend, and then me and him and Ryan and other astrologers went to Sedona. So I met a bunch of other astrologers in Sedona, like KRS and blah, 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 and went back. And, and that was just a huge, uh, huge month for me for gurus, you see, for applying to Jupiter, applying to gurus. And then after that, the Jupiter period came. So that was kind of funny. So you know, it was just kind of more of the same going on. And then after that, the Saturn period came and Saturn is ruled by Jupiter. So it all, the rest of that year was still just carrying out over those themes. So it's kind of cool how the, how my teacher Ernst Wilhelm's own techniques show how, you know, the applying yoga of the moon, the year Lord to Jupiter is going to be um, an event. And it was secretly in McCole. And I think that's actually because, yeah, like a lot of the teachers that I met there and gurus, I was kind of like, uh, like I was kind of grossed out by a lot of the people that I met at the Sedona conference because a lot of them kind of acted like divas. And I was warned of that, you know, um, I, was I was warned about that and, and it turned out to be the case. And so I, I mean, I hardly attended any actual classes. I just hung out in the lobby with Ernst and talked to various 
astrologers that came in and um but yeah i didn't you know yeah and, and a lot of the other astrologers there weren't really they felt kind of i don't think they really liked that we were just hanging out in the lobby and not necessarily going to their classes but it was just kind of happening all so fast so i think that there were a lot of people that were um I don't know. There was definitely, you know, there was definitely some parts of it that I saw u uglier sides of the, the astrology industry, you could say. And, you know, Jupiter was plus six minus six at seven and 10. What's fascinating is when I got back, it was around this period where I got very dissolute. Like I was very high on the whole idea of astrology in the whole world. And when I got back, I saw more of the darker side. I saw how people were behaving, how they were um, so much different from being in person when they conveyed themselves on YouTube or in public and made posts. And I got really disillusioned with the whole career side of being an astrologer. And that was also the very end of my Saturn return, which also had to do with being disillusioned. And uh, yeah, so I was kind of like more disappointed by a lot of the way that some of the gurus and Jupiter people were behaving and stuff and what I saw at the end of that Dasha. But still, overall, really amazing um, what this Rasha Fala chart shows. So I hope you guys enjoy that. And uh, yeah, hope that helps. Take care, you guys. Oh, and if you're really wanting to get more into the technical study of astrology, really you're trying to be an astrologer yourself, or you just really love learning this and are devoted to yoga philosophy, you should really check out my Teachable. I'm now offering um, the Nakshatra course and the Jyotish and Yoga Philosophy course together for only $25 a month. There's a ton of really in-depth content on there that's, you know, really, really heavier stuff than what's meant for YouTube. All right, you guys, take care. Check that out if you want. There should be a link below. Okay, take care. Bye, y'all.